Hi guys, my name is Joe, and my channel is Fighting Words, the Martial Arts Library. This is a segment I call Media Fight Monday, and on Media Fight Mondays I take a look at a fight scene from movies, TV, etc., and I break down the action, and then provide a grade on it based on realism and storytelling value. So we're looking at a fight scene from a movie called Night and the City. Uh, the movie came out in 1950. The fight scene is between two fictitious professional wrestlers, and to do that they got two real professional wrestlers. The shorter, older, bald gentleman is uh, Stanislaus Zabisco. Mr. Zabisco is pretty well known back in the the turn of the century days of professional wrestling. Back when professional wrestling basically meant the same thing as professional boxing, there were people who wrestled for money. It's a little unclear when the transition fully came between real matches and predetermined outcomes. Uh, Mr. Zabisco was involved in what became one of the the last legitimate transitions of a belt <laughs> because he was supposed to lose a match against a guy who wasn't a very good wrestler and he decided he wanted to win so he did uh, the taller gentleman who plays the character of the strangler here is uh, Mike Merzerki who was better known for his uh, appearances in TV and movies but he did spend some time as a professional wrestler. I've chosen this fight because there are actually several legitimate wrestling moves in here, and since my background includes a, a bit of catch-as-catch-can wrestling, I, I'm sort of excited to see some of the action. A bit of a background on the fight. Uh, as far as the choreography goes, there are a total of three people listed as being involved in the wrestling for this movie. I'll put all the names here, but you'll notice that one of them is Mike Mazurki. And I'm going to assume that he and Zabisco sort of worked out how this fight scene was going to go. So basically, as far as the setup goes, um, they are from two rival promoters. Uh, Zabisco's character is old school, and he sees all the other wrestlers, the newer ones, as clowns. So they're having a verbal confrontation, and a fight breaks out. So we get a forearm across the chest. That's a very pro-wrestling-esque move. I don't know if that was meant to be a punch to the jaw. It's another forearm. And here... Uh, Mazurki actually has the double underhooks, but it seems different when they change the angle here. Initially, we saw uh, Zabisco having a full-on bear hug. Now, the advantage of getting double underhooks, if you can get under your opponent's armpits, it makes them very difficult to control your body while you have access to controlling their spinal column very easily. More people jump in to break them up. Mazurki just punches a dude. Zabisco pushes off his second, his trainee. We get a collar tie. And second comes in. Check this out. This is... That is a quarter Nelson. So he's on the back of his head. He's going under his arm and doubling up. And this is a good way to crank someone's neck. In amateur wrestling, it's used to turn someone over. And he dumps him out of the ring. And he winds up injuring his wrist, so he can't come back and rejoin the fight. Now, this looks like an elbow hyperextension here. Now, one of my problems with this fight is that we get a lot of cuts, and we find guys in holds without seeing the intermediate action. So... I'm wondering if, like, the uncut portion of, of this sequence was just, like, 20 minutes of, this, of these guys just wrestling, you know. But this is a similar position to what in judo we would call a wakigatame. He's holding on to his wrist and his opponent's wrist, and he's straightening out his arm using his armpit and ribs as leverage against the back of his arm to lock it out. 
I don't know why he's grabbing the ropes. In a professional contest, that would be a break. Okay. So, he used a hid scissor to turn him over. And here's another dude who doesn't know how to fight. He's trying to fight a guy. He just... Yeah. Leave the fighting to the professionals. Now, that was interesting. We saw Mazurki hit him and then grab his own wrist as if he had injured himself by throwing that punch. It doesn't come up later, but I thought it was a nice touch. So now he's banging on Zbysko, trying to get him off of his arm. Okay, so Zbysko didn't show the transition again, but he's got a, a bear hug and he's trying to push him off of his face. He's hammering him again with punches and forearms. And you can tell that... <laughs> Here's the thing, they're playing nice. How do I know? Because he didn't stick his fingers in his eye, you know? I don't know how that would read on camera, but I do know, like, it happens even by accident in grappling match. Like, you know, I, I got my cornea scratched one time in a grappling match. You know, I guy didn't intend to as far as I know. You know, these things happen, and if this guy wants to play dirty, why not just, like, stick your fingers in his eye? Why? Because they're having a wrestling match, although it's for real. So, yeah, a, a double-handed choke is... It's not a great move. And his boy's yelling out, Go for an arm lever! And he does, which tosses him aside. And he hits the ropes, gets a headlock... Got a front face lock. Now in pro wrestling, this is called a snapmare. I don't know how legit that move is. I, I've seen it demoed in a few different martial arts, and of course, if you grab the guy's head and pull, pull it over your body, he's gonna go. It does seem very risky to me. It it seems like if you don't land that quickly. And when the opponent is very compromised as far as their balance goes, then why wouldn't they just, like, grab you, pull you down, and now I'm behind you, and your arms are being stretched away from your body where they're more vulnerable? It just doesn't seem like a good idea, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody do it in a real fight. So Zabisco gets his own front face lock. And Mazurki's fighting out of it as best he can. He pops out, and Zabisco gets the bear hug. He's just grinding his, his hands into his back. And again, he's, he's pushing off of the face. You can definitely get a lot of separation by pushing off of the chin to break the guy's posture backwards. But again, if he's supposed to be the bad guy, I don't know why he's not digging his fingers into his eyes. So he's given up the bear hug. This, this is actually, I've heard it called a few things. Um, in pro wrestling, I've heard it called the butterfly lock. And I've seen pro wrestler Masahiro Chono make it a regular part of his arsenal. I like Chono. It's sort of a variation of the full Nelson. Um... It's a really good position from which to get a neck crank. You can also sort of work on his shoulders from here by pushing them behind him. And he gives up that and goes for another headlock. And that, again, can actually put a lot of pressure on the neck if you're doing it that way. So Mazurki is kneeing him in the back and the kidneys in an effort to get out of it, which isn't a bad idea. And he's going for what we would call a reverse chancery. That can be a, an incredibly powerful neck crank. The neck bends pretty well forward. It doesn't bend backward very easily. You can also affect a choke from here, sometimes called the north-south choke, or the dragon sleeper, depending on if you're a professional wrestler or not. 
So throws his weight forward and gets out of it. It's got him in the headlock again. And this is what I mean. You know, like what was the transition between, oh, I've thrown him out of it and we're on the ground to we're standing in the corner and I've got him in a headlock. How do those things happen? We're missing chunks of action here. And Mazurki's going for the chin, which is a good idea. It's a punch to the body, not bad. Forearms to the chest, I'm not going to call those punches. That was a punch to the body. And he's posting on his face. He's not really hitting him. All right, this... In judo, that position is called a, a katagatame. Uh, it's also referred to as an arm triangle in like submission grappling and sometimes Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, it's also a pin in amateur wrestling. I actually have an amateur wrestling book that says, you know, that advises people to be careful with it. You know, like, hey, you know, coaches, make sure that they're not holding it too tight or for too long. <laughs> But yeah, uh, and in judo, it's often used as a pin. But yeah, you can you can leverage pressure against the carotids and affect a choke with it pretty easily too. One of my favorites. So he has lost whatever pressure would have been around the neck, and it looks like Mazurki's trying to elbow him. He's he's really not going to be able to do that effectively. He's sort of like sort of rapidly pushing his tricep into the back of his neck. <laughs> Ah, so catch is catch can wrestling. This would be called a double wrist lock. Uh, some places call it a chicken wing. Um, it's more familiar in Brazilian jiu-jitsu as a kimura. This was part of old school wrestling, catch is catch can wrestling, even amateur wrestling to an extent. You know, it does show up in a few amateur manuals. A lot of times, if it was being used from the bottom, it was used to roll the other guy over. And it looks like that might be what's going on here. Here's the thing. If his hand is already behind his back, there's a really good chance to just break the arm. <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll mostly affect the shoulder. Um, but sometimes the joint is tougher than other parts of the arm. And I've seen people actually get, like, their humerus broken by a torquing action on a hold like this. So Mazurki's trying to go for more kidney punches. It's going to be a terrible idea from this position. You can't get any power and you're about to get your arm broken. It's a bad idea. Ah, chop to the trapezius. That's another front face lock. And again, that can be turned into a choke, it can be a neck crank, and, and his student is yelling for the bear hug, again. If you have someone bent over and trapped with a front headlock, sometimes they will try to pull out of it and try to posture up, and that is a good opportunity to usually attack the legs, you know, let them pop up and shoot for a double or something. It's also not a bad idea if you are a Greco-Roman wrestler, like Zabisco actually was, to use it to get to a bear hug, where usually he would go for a throw and try for a pin. In this context, he's going to use the bear hug as a finishing maneuver. You can see Mazurki's trying to, to punch him. Here's the thing, it, it is realistic that those punches wouldn't have a whole lot of steam, because you're essentially having, you're being cut off from your lower body, which is where you get your power from when you throw your punches. Again, I don't know why he isn't, like, ripping at the face. See, now he's, like, trying to punch him in the arms. And the bear hug is tightening. And I think what they're trying to sell this as is he's, like, effectively making it hard for him to breathe, maybe? And this is interesting. First of all, you see his grip has changed a few times, but now he's putting pressure on different sides of Mazurki. And we see Mazurki fading, and he's fading.
And that's the end of that. And because I have the sound off, there's a really good line. He goes, that is what I do with your clowns. As far as realism goes, there was definitely a lot of realistic stuff happening. Nearly all the wrestling moves were 100% legit. You know, you, you had the quarter Nelson, you had the, the double wrist lock, you know, the, the hyper extension of the elbow. Um, you know, headlocks, front headlocks, side headlocks are used to control someone. They can be used to pin someone or wear them down. They can be transitioned into things that affect the neck, you know, like cervical cranks. They can be worked into chokes. Not a big fan of the forearms. <laughs> it's just... Uh, they, in professional wrestling, the reason... Like, you can throw the soft part of your forearm about as hard as you want at an equally soft part of another human being, like their chest. And, you know, it, it's not going to damage them at all. So that's more of like a, a pro wrestling, a working fake. I hate to say that in pro wrestling. I know a lot of pro wrestlers get pissed at it. But that's how you work damage instead of actually causing damage. Not a fan of that. The bear hug sequence, as a finish, I don't like it. You know, in a professional wrestling sense, you know, there are guys who have used it. I think if you get an especially big guy or especially powerfully built guy, you can sell that as a finish maneuver. For the sake of realism, you can put a tremendous amount of pressure on the lumbar spine from that. If you lock up the lower part of the body and drive with your head or your shoulders or your chest into the upper body of the opponent, you're bending them backwards and pulling on that lower spine. You can definitely cause some damage to the lower spine like that. I don't think that that's how they were selling it for this movie. They were selling it as something where I guess you're making it harder for the guy to breathe. And, okay, if you are, like, especially powerfully built and you're going up against, frankly, a much smaller person, <laughs> maybe you can do that. You know, like, if, you know, one of those world's strongest man, you know, Magnus Magnuson types, like, grabs somebody my size around his ribs and just squeezes as hard as he can, I'm probably going to have a lot of trouble breathing. I think for most people, their grip would give out before the opponent's lungs stop sucking in oxygen. So I'm not really buying that part. Especially between two combatants that are, you know, both big, strong guys. You know, again, if you find someone who's much smaller, maybe you can hit something like that and it'll make a difference, right? But two guys about the same size, I don't think so. Uh, so for overall realism... I'm going to give it a B plus. You know, there were enough things that I didn't like in there, especially, you know, it, the finish that took up so much time. You know, like, why didn't you just break the guy's arm with the double wrist lock? You totally could have. <laughs> you know, and there were some sequences that were more, you know, for show than for real. B plus, lots of good stuff, but not quite at the peak of realism. As far as storytelling goes, I think if I'd had the sound on, you know, that would have helped with with the drama because, you know, there's guys from the sidelines who are shouting instructions to both of them and, you know, ah, they're going to kill each other. And that really helps to sell the tension of the scene. But if I'm taking the action in the fight on its own merit, we got Zabisco going for the bear hug twice and finishing the fight with it. I think that helps to tell the story, but there was so much of the action that we just didn't see. You know, the guys are on the ground and suddenly they're standing up and, you know, a guy's being pushed into the corner and suddenly he's in the, the other side of the ropes and, you know, what are we missing? You know, so for that aspect, you know, I, I'm, I'm taking a, a lot of the grade off <laughs> because we're just missing so much. You know, it, it doesn't tell a story with any sense of continuity. In addition, you know, on top of that, like, they're, they're not really showing any sort of damage from anything. Uh, so, again, sort of the continuity is lost. Like, am I locking out this guy's arm? Like, why isn't he shaking his arm out? You know, after, you know, Zabisco had two different very devastating holds on that arm. And it didn't show any particular effect to it. 
So I hate to say it, for storytelling, I'm going to give it a D. You know, I, I like the action, but again, we're losing a lot of the continuity. There really wasn't much continuity going on. So what story are we really telling? I don't know, the story of the bear hug? Sort of. You know, why wasn't he working his way toward that the whole time? So final grade, we got a B plus for realism, and we have a D as far as storytelling. So I appreciate you guys watching along with me. And once again, my name is Joe. If you would like to support the channel, or if you have any ideas for future fight videos, uh, please consider donating to my coffee account. I'm going to put a link to that in the description. And have a good one.